All We're right. live. We are live. This is it. <laughs> this is the beginning of uh, our comprehensive Con- study. Yeah. All right. Could well, thank you, Matt, reason? for uh, inviting me to this uh, event, and uh, let's get started. Yeah. Hopefully, we can have uh, some more people in the future and we'll have a yeah. good time discussing and stuff. So yeah. Uh, All right. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit each time. Right now, I'm planning to go up to page uh, 130 here. Uh, Just get this first little section out of the way, starting with uh, where Khan starts. We're using the uh, Alan Wood and Paul Geyer, I believe, for this uh, translation. So, without any further ado, uh, John, do you want to read? Do you want me to read? Uh, You can read, Matt. Why not? (laughs) All right. Here we go. So it begins. (laughs) Introduction. The idea of transcendental philosophy. Experience is, without doubt, the first product that our understanding brings forth as it works on the raw material of sensible sensations. It is for this very reason the first teaching, and in its progress, it is so inexhaustible in a new instruction that the chain of life in all future generations will never have any lack of new information that can be gathered on this terrain. Nevertheless, it is far from the only field to which our understanding can be restricted. It tells us to be sure what is, but never that it must necessarily be thus and not otherwise. For that very reason, it gives us no true universality, and reason, which is so desirous of this kind of cognitions, is more stimulated than satisfied by it. Now such universal cognitions, which at the time have the character of inner necessity, must be clear and certain for themselves independently of experience. Hence one calls them a priori cognitions. Whereas that which is merely borrowed from experience, as it is put, cognize only a posteriori or empirically. Now, what this <laughs> is, <laughs> do you want to uh, chime with anything, or shall I keep keep going? Uh, no, keep keep going. I'll. All right. Yeah. Well, wait till the uh, section's over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Word word. All right. Now, what is especially remarkable is that even among our experiences, cognitions are mixed in that must have their own origin a priori, and that perhaps only serve to establish connection among our representations of the senses. For if one removes from our experiences everything that belongs to the senses, there still remain certain original concepts and the judgments generated from them, which have, which must have arisen entirely a priori, independently of experience, because they make one able to say more about the objects that appear to the senses than mere experience would teach, or at least make one believe that one can say this and make assertions contain true universality and strict necessity, the likes of which a merely empirical cognition can never afford. But what says still more is this, that certain cognitions even abandon the field of all possible experiences and seem to expand the domain of our judgments beyond all bounds of experience through concepts to which no corresponding objects at all can be given in experience. And precisely in these latter cognitions, which go beyond the world of the senses, where experience can give neither guidance nor correction lie the investigations of our reason that we hold to be far more preeminent in their importance and sublime in their final aim than everything that the understanding can learn in the field of appearances, and on which we would rather venture everything, even at the risk of of erring, than give up such important investigations because of any sort of reservation or from contempt and indifference. Now, it may seem natural that as soon as one has abandoned the terrain of experience, one would not immediately erect an edifice with cognitions that one possesses without knowing whence, and on the credit of principles whose origin one does not know, without having first assured oneself of its foundation through careful investigations, thus that one would have long since raised the question how the understanding could come to all these cognitions a priori, and what domain, validity, and value they might have. And in fact, nothing is more natural, if one understands by this word that which properly and reasonably ought to happen, but if one understands by it that which usually happens, then conversely nothing more is more natural and comprehensible than that, than that this investigation should long have been neglected. For one part... <laughs> oh, are you good? This God. is a lot, I know. Don't worry, we're going to dive into yeah. it. Yeah. We're going to dive into it. For one part of these cognitions, the mathematical has long been reliable, and thereby gives rise to a favorable expectation about others as well, although these may be of an entirely different nature. 
Furthermore, if one is beyond the circle of experience, then one is then one is sure not to be contradicted through experience. The charm in expanding one's cognitions is so great that one can be stopped in one's progress only by bumping into clear contradiction. This, however, one can avoid if one makes his inventions carefully, even though they are thereby inventions any the less. Or sorry, they are not thereby inventions any the less. Mathematics give us a splendid example of how far we can go with a priori cognition independently of experience. <clears throat> now it is occupied, to be sure, with the objects and cognitions only so far as these can be exhibited in intuition. The circumstance, however, is easily overlooked, since the intuition in question can itself be given a priori, and thus can hardly be distinguished from a mere pure concept. Encouraged by such a proof of the power of reason, the drive for expansion sees no bounds. The light dove, in free flight cutting through the air resistance of which it feels, could get the idea that it could do even better in airless space. Likewise, Plato abandoned the world of the senses because it posed so many hindrances for the understanding and dared to go beyond it on the wings of the ideas in the empty space of pure understanding. He did not notice that he made no headway by his efforts, for he had no resistance, no support, as it were, by which he could stiffen himself and to which he could apply his powers in ordinary to get his understanding off the ground. It is, however, a customary fate of human reason in speculation to finish its edifice as early as possible, and only then to give, or sorry, and only then to investigate whether the ground has been well adequately adequately prepared for it. But at that point, all sorts of excuses will be sought to assure us of its sturdiness, or to refuse such a late and dangerous examination. What keeps us free of all worry and suspicion during this construction, however and flatters us with apparent thoroughness is this. A great part, perhaps, the greatest part of the business of our reason consists in the analysis, or sorry, analyses of the concepts that we already have of objects. This affords us a multitude of cognitions that, though they are nothing more than illuminations or clarifications of that which is already thought in our concepts, though still in a confused way, are, at least, as far as their form is concerned, treasured as if they were new insights, though they do not extend the concepts that we have in either matter or content, but only set them apart from each other. Now, since this procedure does yield a real a priori cognition, which makes secure, useful, or sorry, which makes secure and useful progress, reason without itself noticing it, under these pretenses, surreptitiously <laughs> makes. <laughs> I've honestly not heard that word before. <laughs> yeah. Makes assertions of quite another sort in which it adds something entirely alien to given concepts a priori without one knowing how it was able to do this and without this question even being allowed to come to mind i will therefore deal with this distinction between these two kinds of cognitions right at the outset all right so let me just say one thing jesus fucking christ <laughs> what the fuck yes sir wow all this right is this is the beginning of the work that Honestly, it changed my life. Not going to lie, this changed how I saw the world. And he gives a lot of the great exposition early on. So, uh, let's see if there's something I can draw. Can I just whoop, can mess around with this a little bit? Can I not? I can only draw on the, on the paper. <laughs> All right, uh, yeah, it's stupid. You can't do like a whiteboard. Uh, I don't think so. It's okay. can do a whiteboard, uh, but I would have to adjust the setting real quick. So, uh, I'm just going to stop the recording for a second and then get it up once I have it. All right, we're back. I got the whiteboard. Let's you got go. the whiteboard. I got the whiteboard. All right, so let's look at this thing here. All right. So, first thing he says here, let's save Nick of significance is the first line. Ooh, I can just underline it like this. Okay, so experience without a doubt is the first product that our understanding brings forth as it works on the raw material of sensible sensations. So, 
Uh, yeah, so a big debate coming into Khan's thing was... Rationalism. Versus empiricism, is that? Yes, sir. You guessed it. So, rationalism, its core tenet is basically that uh, experience comes from reason, comes from ideas, right? The uh, He talks about it a little later on. Uh, he brings up Plato. Uh, can, we, can we maybe um, like name a few rationalist philosophers? Yeah, Just... well, yeah, that's what I was. So Kant brings up the first was considered the first rationalist philosopher in the Western tradition of philosophy in Plato. He brings up Plato hmm. with the. Um, he says that Plato abandoned the world of the senses because it posed so many hindrances for the understanding. Yeah, that's pretty much a great way to sum up rationalist philosophy. Um, they view that the senses are unreliable for gaining true knowledge. Um, they hit, like like Kant says right here, he it hinders the understanding. That's the rationalist view. Um, and most famously, I think, uh, in the modern period, it kicked off the modern period of rationalism with Descartes and his uh, meditations, where he sort of doubts the uh, the empirical world and only finds truth through reason, which is uh, something we could look into um, if we want, but. Essentially, what you really need to understand for that is that uh, the real world, not the real world, the empirical world for rationalists basically yields not reliable knowledge. It deceives us. It, the only way we can get past these deceptions is by using ideas alone that are uh, not influenced by experience. Um, right. And then... And on the other side of that, I guess you have the empiricists, like, yes. sorry, I'm wrong, Matt, but like David Hume, uh, Barclay, um, Bar yeah, right, right. John Locke is a big one. John um, Locke. Before I go on to the empiricists, uh, Kant has a word, a very important word that we'll see all throughout this work. Uh, trying to underline this here. <laughs> a priori cognitions. These are these are the uh, independently of experience right here a priori ideas. That's what the rationalists are built upon. If you can write that here, a priori. They believe knowledge is derived from a priori ideas, essentially meaning prior to experience. Empiricism is all about not that. It's the opposite of that. The <laughs> knowledge comes from. The posteriori? Senses. Yes, a posteriori. He does. Yes. Does he bring that up in this section? I don't think he does. I think he just talks about a priori. Right? Unless I'm missing it. Uh, oh, here we go. Yep. Cognized only a posteriori or empirically. Yes, yeah, so these are the two. These are the two rivaling things. A posteriori. So there's an essential metaphysical difference here. Well, why is your posterior? Did I, did I misspell this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a posteriori. <laughs> a posterior. E, e, a, I'm so tired, bro. <laughs> a posteriori. That's right, right? I, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think so. Word. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the, these, essentially, these things right here, these are the two epistemological, metaphysical tenets that rival each other. Um, and Kant brings these up here. Um, so Kant says, experience is without a doubt the first product of our understanding that brings forth as it works on the raw material of sensible sensations. So, Kant, what it sounds like he might be saying is that experience begins a posteriori. Uh, however, it's not just that, because he also says it gives us no true universality. 
and reason, which is so desirous of the kind of cognitions, is stimulated, more stimulated and satisfied by it. So, there's sort of a mix going on here. Kant's acknowledging both a priori and a posteriori cognitions. And basically what he's saying is, yes, experience is how knowledge, it begins with experience, but really what he's going to look for is what makes experience possible. And that's where the a priori comes in for Kant. It really comes in, a priori for Kant is going to make this thing possible. So he's saying that there's a sort of consciousness that comes before experience yes that's exactly it and this consciousness uh, to use your terms is a prior comes from a priori knowledge mm, okay um, so we're going to get more into that but then as we go on uh, a priori establish connections among our own representation of the senses Right, so Kant, so Kant is admitting here that if you remove from our everything that comes from our experience, you still have a priori ideas. Right, which I guess, I mean, to skip a little bit ahead, that would be like things in themselves. Um, or... no, that's the sort of thing. A priori is just without experience. So, and then he uh, later on he brings up. Uh, Mathematics gives us a splendid example of how far we can go with a prior cognition. So, like, the best example of things like this is mathematics. Um, mm. And it brings up... Uh, I don't think he brings up too many more um, until he gets to a pretty groundbreaking thing a little later on uh, in the first part of this, which is called the Transcendental Aesthetic. The Critique of Pure Reason is broken up into two parts, Transcendental Aesthetic and then the Transcendental Logic. And the Transcendental Aesthetic uh, deals with things sort of just perception essentially how perce how we perceive our world and the trans transcendental logic sort of explores the limits of our thinking um mm, okay and how far we can go beyond the the transcendental aesthetic um using pure reason so um that's a more just kind of general outlook on this work in general so for now yes we have uh a priori posteriori knowledge begins with a posteriori as uh, correctly pointed out by uh, David Hume. However, what David Hume missed is what makes this even possible. And that's where rationalism comes in for Kant. And he's going to go into that more detailed uh, later on. So I think the rest of this page essentially... yeah. So he's pointing out more interesting and important things here. Um, yes, we have judgments beyond the... Uh, all bounds of experience through which concepts no uh, through concepts to which no corresponding object at all can be given an experience so yes we do have these ideas uh, he's he's giving some credit to the rationalist here that we do have ideas in which we uh, in which we have without experience so that's huge and that's something that the ra uh, that the empiricists wouldn't really be you trans of um and it's actually interesting. what's up but Kant's not a rationalist right uh no he's a transcendental idealist which combines these things mm. which you're getting a very brief preview of here this so the, yeah this is this this is it this is the idea of his transcendental philosophy right okay um so this is something brand new so he's not re he doesn't fall into strictly one of these camps he uh he really goes beyond them by bringing them both together, synthesizing them. Um, uh, okay. Little, I guess that's why it was so... Yeah, yeah. I guess that's why it was so groundbreaking. Yes, yes. This was this was totally, totally new. Um, so, let's see. Now, let me see. As soon as we abandon the train of experience, we'll not immediately recognize this kind of... Right, so he's basically talking about the mathematical here um, and how that really doesn't fit well into a purely empirical thing. And the empiricist, oh yes, that's what I was going to bring before actually. The empiricist had a pretty hard time dealing with mathematics. They, they were trying to come up with uh, 
empirical uh, solutions to basically explain the phenomenon of mathematics and our cognition. And uh, they had a really hard mix-up time doing that. And Kant will, as he goes on, will show you why. And he sticks to this, that it's an a, truly an a priori thing, and that's what the rationalists had right. Um, however, the rationalists weren't all right, though, because, the, uh, as he says in the very beginning, knowledge does begin with experience. So, and experiential things do play an essential role in the development of our knowledge. Um, Right. So, uh, which we look explore further. So, as we keep going here, uh, essentially just keep covering uh, the fact that we do have a priori cognitions. And, uh, procedure goes procedure. So something else he brings up interesting here is uh, concepts uh, of objects. Um, and that's interesting. So because concepts of objects, um, so this kind of gives a little brief preview as well into how the a priori can um, affect our knowledge of the a posteriori. Um, we have concepts of objects. So, uh, we're not, so, a posteriori, right? Empirical objects, um, as Kant will say, eventually, they're given to us. Um, but they don't really come with anything, right? They're just objects. They're not really intelligible on their own. Um, so we have concepts of them, and that's, that's pretty huge for Kant as well. And the concepts are a priori, right? It says here, uh, so when we go through the process of basically applying concepts to objects, it yields a real a priori cognition, which makes... So concepts applied to objects gives us a priori, uh, or the, at least that's a, it yields a priori cognition. Um, so, uh, so that's a pretty important thing. Yeah? Can, can we, can we uh, <laughs> for, for my mind, can we yes. unpack that so... Yes, what do you, I can uh, try to expand this for a little bit too. So, just that one part about the about objects, the and the, yeah, and a priori concepts with the objects or something. Right, so, um, so they're objects, right? So let's just say we have like a box, an object, or right. an empirical object. Uh, this is just an object, right? It's unintelligible, mm -hmm. there's no like viewer right of the object mm -hmm. there's no thinker mm -hmm. right, but let's say we had a person here right uh and this person right uh it's a human right so there's a brain and inside and basically representing the mind um right and inside of this is a priori concepts um and he's going to go into what these concepts are a lot of it has to do with, like, just to give you a brief preview, like, logical forms, um, grammar, language, things like that. Um, right. I'll go more specifically into that. But, um, essentially, we have these concepts, and then we... Oh, we recognize them? Yeah, in, yeah, in the, so in the object. So, mm -hmm. like, well, guys, no, not because... For Kant, they're not in the object. <laughs> a lot, it's hard to talk about this stuff without, like, sounding confusing because he goes into it later on, but I'm just trying to give, like, a brief synopsis of what he's saying in here. Yeah, I mean, we can come back to it if it's kind of too yeah. jumping. Yeah, but the important thing is to know is that we have concepts in our head, essentially, and yeah. what these yield are a priori uh, cognitions. Um, and we have concepts of objects, so... Uh, that are not given from the object, right? The object does not give us concepts. That's a little messy, but I'll just, I can just write that out with words. Objects do not give concepts because objects are experiential, right? And concepts, at least the kind of concepts that Kant's talking about here are a priori. So the objects do not give the concepts, 
they are our concepts in our head before experience, just kind of given to us uh, spontaneously as Kant would say later on. Mm. Um, okay. And I believe that is all the important uh, things that I think I want to go over for this part. This part seems a little empty with annotations, so I do want to relook at this real quick before we close off this quick introductory section <laughs> session <laughs> good lord i'm so tired <laughs> don't forget to uh like favorite and subscribe <laughs> click that notification bell <laughs> yeah uh the precise things that are conditions wait the precise things that which go beyond the world of the senses Oh, okay. So he's just kind of describing a priori um, and how they go beyond. Yeah. So I basically summed that up well, I think. Uh, a priori, the fact that it sort of goes beyond reason. And he, I feel like this Plato thing is really helpful for the a priori thing in general. I think we can really just keep going back to this for that, honestly. Sort of yeah. abandoning the world for the senses. Uh, for Kant, um, it doesn't hinder the understanding. Um, but like I said, we'll go into that. That, that comes later. <laughs> A lot of the stuff comes later. So, yeah. Huh? Hmm. Honestly, I think that's about it. Not too bad. It sounds really bad when uh, we're going through it just straight without right. the annotations. But hopefully when we come back to it, it'll make sense. Uh, is there anything you had questions on, John? Any parts of this? If you just want to look over the parts we went over real quick. Uh, I think it, I think it makes sense to me. Um, so far, um, it's a good little introduction there. Uh, Everything makes sense with a priori, posteriori, you know, empirical yeah. versus yeah. abstract, non-empirical. Uh, yeah, well, it's concepts. interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that Plato was considered, like, a rationalist. Yeah, the rationalist. He's considered, to my knowledge, the first uh, Western, or the first rationalist in the Western philosophical tradition, to my knowledge. Yeah, that's, that's well, hmm. but even with the theory of the forms and everything, like, that was, oh, well, I guess, yeah, right, because it's beyond experience. I see, I see. Yeah, exactly. Huh. Uh, he's trying to go beyond experience, because he thinks that, right, the world of of forms, uh, he, no, sorry, the world of, like, the empirical world, right, are just images of these higher forms. Right. Um, and Kant doesn't agree there. Uh, he's trying to, again, it may not be clear now, just in these first few pages, but essentially he's trying to pave the way, uh, you might see in the language he's using, he's, he's kind of treating these things as uh, just different things, but equal, whereas rationalists and empiricists both kind of were just, like, pooping on each other. <laughs> mm. yeah they both thought their respective things were superior and the other were just kind of more or less like accidental faculties that you know the mind just kind of has that aren't aren't good for understanding uh knowledge for getting knowledge. right um but yeah Kant changes that and that's really what makes him significant and like i said uh a good while earlier uh definitely changed how i view the world changed my life for real uh <laughs> yeah uh yeah and it may sound a little wonky now but just trust just follow uh and it'll a lot of it too i think has to do with this translation um i was going to use the other translation i had the physical copy which is what did i say it was marcus uh marcus Weigelt or something uh yeah oh yeah marcus weigel is uh the one i wanted to use but this translation just ended up being much more popular much more accessible so uh, we use this right. one, and I think it does make it a little hard to understand um, than the other one. But hopefully, this makes enough sense. And uh, yeah, uh, next time we'll be focusing on this section: the difference between analytic and synthetic judgments. Uh, and this is where Kant gets really crazy with his epistemology. Um, I'll do some epistemological. So this one was just pretty short background, but for this section, we're going to have a little more background. So we'll do that all next right time. Uh, so, uh, and All right. John, before we, uh, close this introductory, uh, session out? Uh, no, I think we're good, Matt, and, uh, 
we will meet next time. Yes, looking forward to it. Absolutely. Well, John, thank you, and uh, yes. thank you, whoever's watching. Uh, this <laughs> made sense. This is, uh, if you couldn't tell, our first go at this. So, um, any suggestions, any confusions uh, to anyone watching? Uh, Please let us know in the comments yeah, down below. Let us know for real, and uh, yeah, hopefully next time yeah. more people will be here too. So any mistakes I'm making or anything doesn't make sense, hopefully other people will be able to catch on. Yeah, you know, pick on before we can uh, figure it out from there. But yeah, if everything makes sense to you, then I'm confident this is a good enough uh, introductory session. So, no, I think so. I think it's good. Awesome. All right, All right. John. It's been real. Yeah, it's been good. And uh, yeah, thank you to anyone watching. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, catch you next time for the next part of G Computer Reason. Woohoo! See you next time. Peace out.